Good morning. I hope you survived last night okay. We've been already through one presentation or two couple of presentations, so uh, you should be awake by now, caffeinated. All right. So uh, it seems there's no one introducing me, so I'll do that myself. Um, my name is Sven Erik Knob. Uh, no, I'm not Swedish or Danish or another, I'm actually German. Um, I work for Perforce at the UK office in Wokingham as a senior technical specialist um, for the technical marketing department. Before that, uh, the first seven years I was Perforce uh, as a uh, technical consultant. And my Twitter handle, in case you want to leave any feedback, is a P for Sven. Right, what I want to talk about. Um, I guess most of the stories that are told here um, start with the idea of continuous delivery and, and some kind of pipeline. Um, I just want to set the scene again why we do this in the first place and why this is important. Um, although this is not a marketing talk, I will have to also very quickly um, introduce Perforce in case you don't know it. Who of you knows Perforce? Okay, about half of them. Who of you uses Perforce? About the same, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know Perforce, um, I'll just give a quick overview what is Perforce, what is Perforce Helix. Um, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the talking about the, the plugin, the connection between um, Perforce, Perforce Helix, and um, Jenkins. As a path to work for DSL here in the agenda, um, to be honest, when I, when, when I had this idea for this talk over four weeks ago, we had this idea that would be a good thing to add the DSL capability to the plugin as well. And I thought it was easy. Um, it wasn't as easy as it looked. Um, I got most of, most of the working is still in, in preliminaries. It's not um, uh, pushed back to um, the public survey yet, um, but it will be there in the next few weeks. Um, so if you want to give it a try, then uh, you can do that very soon. All right, let's talk about continuous delivery. Why do we do this? Um, who of you is using continuous delivery? Who would you like to use continuous delivery? That's what I thought. It's always the same thing. It's an aspiration. It's not necessarily a reality. Why is that so difficult? Well, have you ever walked to the shop and said, I uh, would like to have this continuous delivery tool, please? And it turns out they say, hmm, 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 hmm. We can give you bits and pieces of that. But it turns out continuous delivery, achieving that, is actually more a change of process, a change of culture, than it is to actually have tooling. So tools help. Um, but uh, get the path from the requirement all the way up to the deployed uh, um, structure is, is a, a difficult thing. Some things need to change if you want to go to a continuous delivery pipeline. One of the things that will, and that's probably something that's been talked about here a lot, um, the collaboration, people talking together, people working together. Um, if you want to be able to deploy something that you have created only a few minutes or a few hours ago, um, you need to take care not just of the code itself, you also have to think about deployment option, the testing, uh, the QA stages and so on, all the way up to the delivered article. Um, which means your workflow will change. You have to think suddenly about a lot more about the steps that go on beyond. Um, a key part of that is communication between different groups. Uh, you as a developer, if you don't know what the database changes are looking like, you know, what the uh, changes along, uh, along the pipeline of delivery and so on look like, then you have no clue how your change will impact an already deployed um, uh, structure. Another way aside, if you look at the DevOps side, who of you is DevOps here? And developers? Okay, it's about half and half, something like that. Um, so uh, when the DevOps people do not talk to the, the um, uh, people on the development side uh, and have this gap in between, the developers like to push out the stuff as quick as possible and see the results. Uh, ideally, I would like to see my change happening somewhere uh, within a day or so. Um, the DevOps people are going, oh, wait, I, I have to... Um, uh, go through all these checks and make sure everything works, and I can't certainly put this on the live site um, very quickly. So it might take, I'm not sure how you've been, I know that some of the changes that I put in uh, in the past took half a year to get actually on the, uh, into the live product. By then I have forgotten what I've done there. Um, 
and I, I have no feedback. Uh, the requirements have changed. That it all doesn't make sense. So, all our move towards agile, towards um, Scrum methodologies, something like that, in, in quick cycles. If they take ages to get to the deployment stage, they're not going to happen. And I'm going to forget about that. So communication between the different groups is important, and the flexibility to work um, with, um, with the teams, uh, people along the pipeline, not just with the tools, is important. If you do that, you need to be able to see every single aspect of it. You need, um, the people in DevOps have to be able to see the source code. You need to be able to see the, the changes going to the database, the changes going to the configuration files. Um, and so on along the line. So visibility is another important aspect if you want to achieve um, the continuous delivery pipeline. Now one of the most important aspects, the reason why I'm standing here, um, of course is um, version everything. Uh, if you don't version every single aspect of your pipeline, then you can't roll back in case something goes wrong. You can't follow through who, which change originated in a problem that you experience um, on your, uh, in your live product, um, and you do not achieve the complete visibility. Uh, version everything doesn't just apply to the source code. It applies to every single aspect. So certainly the artifacts. If you don't uh, save the artifacts, if you have to recompile the artifacts again before you go live, and it turns out the compiler you're using has slightly different changes on it, or it's a slightly different environment, or a different libc, or something like that in place, then what you tested and what you finally get as a product are two different things. Uh, and how many of you have said it worked on my computer? <laughs> At least one admits it. I'm quite sure there are more of you among that um, as well. And that is exactly the problem. Um, this is true for the database as well. Who of you is versioning your database? That's the same problem. Oh, same person. Okay, a few of those. Uh, there are a few products around. I think there was someone here from Redmine who did something of that, or DB Maestro, um, where you can actually version database artifacts as well. Uh, schema changes, um, as well as um, which tool do you use? Okay. Um, so that, this is an important aspect. Uh, databases are extremely hard to roll back, especially if you just changed 100 million rows. Um, so it has to be a controlled prospect. If you have complete visibility and I've version every single aspect of that is on the lines, not just the source code, but also the artifacts, the configuration files, maybe the whole project uh, itself as a, as a Docker image or something like that, then one of the uh, things that come in there is uh, security. Um, there is a lot of the IP that's stored in this uh, uh, in, in, your, in your storage, in your, your version management system, um, and that needs to be secured. Um, you need to control who's got access to it, at least, or at least verify that the right people accessing it, uh, even if you trust all your, uh, your members in your team to access that as well. So it's important that your management man version management system uh, can deliver that as well. So there's lots of requirements you have to fulfill before you even get to the point of changing your culture uh, and setting up a pipeline. What does that have to do with Perforce? Okay, so let me give a quick introduction on who Perforce is and what Perforce Helix is. This is the part where I go marketing. Um, and don't worry, I'll keep that short. So what do we do? Perforce has been around for 20 years. Uh, it's a Californian company uh, with offices around the world and partners as well to um, help our customers um, as quick as possible. Uh, one of the big aspects that we have is uh, technical support to be able to support our, um, our customers as quick as possible. Who is using, uh, who, who uses us? Um, there is um, all kinds of things that are stored on the Perforce server. One of the best, biggest things that we do is uh, we store binary files as well as source code to quite ridiculous sizes. Uh, very large teams uh, you can use um, Perforce to store all the artifacts, all the source code, and so on. Not just software, but um, in the games industry, for example, most of the computer games you play these days uh, started life inside the Perforce server. Um, in electronics, um, the majority of chipsets uh, that you use are uh, defined whatever device you're in uh, typically will spend their life uh, at one stage or another inside the Perforce server. And there are all kinds of other tools around. 
uh, from the enterprise. It's probably easier to tell the story from the point of view of where our customers are, in case you don't know perforce. But you might know some of these names. Now, when a vendor comes here and says, look at our customer list, and then you drill a little bit deeper and you go, oh yeah, they have 20 users over there in the corner and they use our product. Um, we can still put them on a website, oh, these are our customers. Um, this is a bit different. Um, so if you look at the names of what about Qualcomm and NVIDIA, um, if you look at game companies like EA or Ubisoft, or extreme case, Pixar, Are you familiar with Pixar? Okay, they've taken this idea of version everything to the very extreme. They started out versioning the tools, the software tools that built the build design, and then started to think about, oh, we can store the textures and other bits and pieces and the models we have. Every single frame of every single movie is stored uh, in a Perforce server in Pixar. Now, they're talking about petabytes in a way that still frightens me. Uh, it's not so big a number anymore. I just did the calculation in my head. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 set of, of hard drives these days that have the petabyte. Not filling this room anymore as it did for years ago, uh, but it's still a very large number. Um, the same is true for the likes of Salesforce um, or Samsung. I'm just calling out a few names in here. Um, just some ideas of the scale of what's going on here. Um, a Qualcomm 9,500 users use Perforce. Um, at NVIDIA, NVIDIA, every single user uses Perforce, and every single document they have goes into a Perforce server. Um, a Salesforce, they do 10 million transactions a day through the Perforce servers. Every single change goes through that. So their pipelines are of an extreme case. And Samsung is our largest customer now with over 20,000 users. So um, uh, there's a lot going on. The modern technology, well, that's a big stretch, but uh, it, is, it is true, modern technology that we are used to from the chip platform and software and so on out there would not be possible without uh, having Perforce around or some tools like that. Why is this important? Um, Kusuke already said that yesterday in his keynote, and uh, software is eating the world. Uh, I'm not sure if Mark Anderson was the one who, key, who, uh, who um, coined that phrase, uh, but he's certainly famous for that. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that in any product that we touch these days, there is bits and pieces of software in there. Any ideas how many lines of code go into a car, a modern car these days? No? Well, they tell me it's about 100 million lines of code. To put that into respect, uh, in an Airbus A380, um, which is a fun play to fly in, if, by the way, and it's a big piece of engineering, that's 35 million lines of code. In a humble little car, 100 million lines of code. Um, the Airbus story, by the way, uh, that's excluding the uh, entertainment system, which itself is, is, is a completely different story. So with that, when you create a product these days, um, whether it's a car or a piece of software, a piece of hardware, any shape or form, there's a lot of, so there's a lot of source code going in there as well. Actually, there are file types of all kinds and sizes going into the product. Not just the source, not just the, the drawings for your, um, uh, for your designs, or the requirement documents, or the 3D models um, that go in there, um, but all the different aspects on that. So there are many different contributors with lots of different kind of artifacts that you put in there. And when it comes out of it all, are the products we know and love. And they're not in one single place anymore. Um, how many of you work in a single office with no satellite office whatsoever? There gotta be one in here. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I typically ask a question about who of you has, got, has not got a smartphone? Okay. When I asked this question last year, um, there were at least 10% still showing up, so uh, it has now gone down to zero. Um, same problem with that as well. Okay, so you all work in global offices, um, and you have contributors around global offices, certainly as the case for us, uh, our development team is spread over three different continents, um, that um, they're all contributing to our finished product. And you've got to spread this thing around. And we're not talking about 100 million lines of code and uh, terabytes of assets and so on. That's not an easy task. So um, the geography uh, distribution certainly adds the complexity to that. 
Another problem is if all these people live in different silos. So if you've got source code in one system, typically Git or SVN, um, if you've got all your digital assets in yet another place, uh, you've got the requirement documents, yet in a third storage, and the artifacts wind up in the fourth storage. Um, how do you keep track of what effect, what, um, what this change that this artifact I have in my hand, where is the source code that made this up, where is the requirement document that backed this up, and so on. If they all live in different places, then the trouble is um, you have no control of what is going on in there, and it makes it very hard. What it winds up is that people write lots of tools on top of that. Uh, my extreme case of that is the Android project. It lives in 480 different kind of Git repositories. And then two layers of management on top of that with repo and other bits and pieces on top of that to keep track of all these things. Maybe it's not the right storage for that. I know that the Samsung, for example, it doesn't have a problem. It takes all the code and puts it in one single before server. And then they have the overview. So if you're looking for something that can keep track of all the assets, all your source code, all the bits and pieces in that, secure it in a way that you know who has got access, who has accessed which file, which uh, um, is also inter interesting if you're uh, worried about IP theft. Um, if you're uh, working uh, uh, together with a, a distributed team around the world, um, and you're thinking, why does this cannot live in one single storage? Then uh, maybe you should have a look at uh, what Perforce Helix is, uh, support. So Perforce Helix, for those of you who know Perforce already, um, uh, the, the name Helix of that is not a new product. It is a, um, um, a rebranding to uh, make it very clear that um, all the different bits and pieces that all the parts have been introduced in the last years uh, all belong to the same core as well. It is a single storage that can take any uh, document from any source, uh, whether it's Git repositories or uh, whatever Unity or Word documents or any kind of other part, and that, and then um, uh, it plug into your continuous integration engines, uh, your delivery systems in any shape or form, one of them, of course, being Jenkins. Um, it is scalable uh, from the extreme small case uh, my personal Puffer server at home runs my Raspberry Pi and stores my children's homework um, to the extreme cases of 20,000 users and uh, multi-terabyte or even petabyte of storage. Um, accessible anywhere, distributed systems, fabrication technology built in uh, and secured to make sure that uh, your IP is protected. And of course, Puffer enables you to work on a continuous delivery pipeline as well. Um, picking up all the different sources that we have. Uh, we have only a review system in there called Swarm um, that allows you to, to, to review those changes coming in um, and then piping it through uh, all the way down to deployment, storing the artifacts as well. Um, I'm not going to have a live demo here today, but uh, um, uh, not here, but I have a, a presentation, um, uh, quick lightning presentation, quarter past one uh, over in the... Um, the room where I, I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration of how the pipeline could look like and what kind of things you could do with that. Okay, so what does it have to do with Jenkins? Well, um, Perforce is a version management system. It can store all the assets and all your files. Um, Jenkins is the most important continuous, uh, continuous integration engine uh, out there with where the market share of 70%, I think. Um, so it's kind of obvious that we have to have some kind of plugin. The plugin requirement was there, uh, clearly. Um, so strong that the community went out there and built it themselves because they needed that. Um, and, uh, but we had the requests from, from a majority of customers, which is, we've got about 10,000 customers, but 400,000 users, uh, paying customers, and, and a lot more. Uh, Perforce is free for 20 users and less, so um, there are quite a few of them that use it commercially without ever telling us about it. Um, so the requirement to have a Jenkins plugin allows you to pull data out of Perforce and to store it back in again. So we decided we're going to pick up this, this Jenkins plugin and um, work in it ourselves. So there now, if you look at the uh, Jenkins plugin side, there are two different plugins there. It's a Perforce plugin, which was the community build. Uh, version, uh, which I would call the, the old version, 
and our plugin is called P4 plugin to have it a different name um, for reasons of completely rebuilding it. Um, we couldn't keep it compatible, unfortunately. We love that they just taken it over and, and rebuild it again. The big difference between both plugins is mostly that um, our P4 plugin is based on 100% Java. Uh, the old plugin is a, is a wrapper around the P4 executable, which is similar to the Git executable or SVN executable, uh, a small little binary file, but which is, of course, very specific to each particular platform. Having it 100% Java means that I can now go and simply deploy this uh, through the Jenkins method on the different slaves uh, without any problems and there it can just access the before server and extract all the data in there. So it's developed by Perforce, by um, Perforce users in-house, um, but it is an open source project and there are many contributors out there um, who are using the plugin themselves and like to have extension in that to put bug fixes in there or extend uh, further with that. And certainly it's a collaborative effort, it's not just a corporate in-house thing. And it has extended capabilities. Just a list of capabilities, I hope your eyesight is good. Uh, just put them up. This is actually from the, the readme file that the, uh, our developer Paul put up there. Um, so um, the things you can do is, it, it, before a server, it stores everything. So you need to, you need to uh, start down what you're actually interested in. Uh, this is defined through what we call workspaces, similar to Jenkins workspace. A place in local disk, it defines, uh, I'm going to work in this particular project. Uh, once I'm going to pull that out. Um, so a, a sophisticated workspace management is useful. Um, the buffer server is secured and that only um, authenticated users can access it. Um, so it needs to have uh, sophisticated performance authentication in there. Um, uh, pulling all the data out, it could quickly be hundreds of millions of uh, uh, hundreds of megabytes uh, or even more. So pulling and filtering in there is, is quite important. Um, we also have the ability to go and, and tag the changes in there, so when you pull the data out, you build it, it works fine, you want to tag it afterwards, and the professor has added a label to it, uh, that is possible. And um, you can also push changes back, which is, um, of course, one of the interesting parts for us. So you create your artifacts, and then you submit the artifacts back again. And the example of that I will demonstrate in the uh, quick lightning talk, um, a quarter past one in the next room. Okay. Now, Let's talk about DSL. Who of you is using workflow already? Not as many as I expected. What's holding you up? Okay, no complicated, do you use pipeline? Some of them use pipeline, okay, ready. All right, so pipeline is quite the linear thing. I have set up, it's certainly useful, but the demo I have over there is a, uh, uh, a pipeline demo, demonstration, um, but the, the problem is if these things get more complicated, then having a pipeline in there uh, makes, um, it, it's difficult to have. You want to make a decision. If these tests pass, maybe run these tests, uh, build this, deploy that on this platform, uh, go through different uh, kind of, um, uh, different target platforms you want to work on and so on. So it made sense for us to add the, uh, the ability for workflow DSL in there. Um, the underlying technology was already mostly there uh, so it did work, um, but this is a preview. Um, we're not quite done yet. Um, it, this, the changes will go back um, in the next couple of weeks, I would think. Uh, I'll be taking over the programmers. Um, you can do this. So if you use the workflow plugin, um, you're writing Groovy code uh, to describe uh, what you actually want to do on that particular node and put your, your commands into that Groovy code. If you want them to uh, extract something from a before server, you would have to put something like this in. This is auto-generated. It is still ugly. Um, and our aim was to get, try to get rid of it and make it easier for you to use. So take this away. This looks easier. So P for sync. Uh, this long credential bit, don't worry about that. I'll show you in a moment how to get rid of that. I'm going to work the stream, work this data on there, and with this one single command, you fill your workflow with all the data coming out from the particular workspace. Um, the good news is that uh, our Jenkins friends have added the snippet generator, which makes life very, very simple. 
Um, so instead of you having to type in all these credentials and other bits and pieces yourself, or wondering what kind of what kind of options do I have uh, for that, uh, most of the uh, plugins that support the workflow have this this uh, snippet generator added to that, um, and this makes it very simple to um, pull the bits and pieces out. So uh, the credentials, for example, it is much easier to remember this is this user on this particular server over there that you're going to use. Uh, than to think of the, the long uh, UUID string, um, which I can easily mistype. And I can specify the code line here. Uh, there are alternative ways as well, but first it's been around for a while, and there are lots of different ways you can slice, uh, slice and dice the data. In there, stream is certainly the, uh, the modern, uh, easiest way to do that, uh, but you can also specify an absolute path, similar to what you do for an SVN, or you can use a template workspace and other methods as well. Um, Perforce is uh, Unicode capable, um, depending on whether you enable that or not, you have to specify the jar set, um, and this is the word format of the workspace that you want to use internally, uh, just names for, for easy um, manually. And outcomes, when you generate the Kubi code, this bit over here, uh, which you can then just copy paste into your workflow, uh, DSL for that. Now, there are two other commands that I would have loved to have added, uh, if I hadn't had the time is um, pivot tag and pivot publish. So pivot tag will allow you, um, if, uh, as part of your build, to go and tag the, the sources that came in. Um, uh, if you uh, um, successfully build uh, your environment. Uh, before tags are a bit different than what you used to from Git. Um, and, and Git, the tag is just a label on a, um, on a particular change. Uh, Perforce has different kinds of tags, and one of them, the static tab, Tag allows you to be extended so I can um, not just have the source code that go when the particular build can also uh, mark the asset files afterwards, which is a step beyond a different change, um, so that I can simply afterwards take the asset file, look at it, find uh, this is the tag on it, and then find the sources that come uh, that generated this particular file in there. And the other part, uh, P4 Publish, um, which will allow you to either submit the change back to before us or even to shelve the files uh, back. Shelving is, um, uh, if you come from Git, it's similar to um, the stashing, but this is on the stashing on the server, on the central server that can be inspected by other users, can be used for code reviewing, can be used for testing, can be used for testing on different platforms, for example, um, and it's a very nice capability. Um, I just had a conversation with someone from Ublox. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, they explained to me how I use that as a, as a pre-commit um, uh, technology to, to verify that um, uh, the, the changes are actually correct before they submit them to their, the common code line. So, in conclusion, and I'll have a, a, few, changes, a few times for questions as well. Um, we believe Perforce Helix is the, the foundation for continuous delivery. Um, if continuous delivery has the mantra of version everything, um, then versioning should include not just your source code, but also all the configuration files, uh, assets, requirement documents, as well as the artifacts that you pull out again afterwards. Um, if you have to spread them over lots of different kind of sources, lots of different uh, silos, um, then it's easy to lose track, and it forces you to build more stuff around it. Jenkins, you are here because you want to learn how to use Jenkins the best way for continuous integration or even continuous delivery. Um, both are, imagine heaven, I guess, uh, is the word for that. So P4 plugin is, is the glue between both of them that we are continuing to build uh, and extend with the help of the feedback from our customers and the, and the active help from our customers as well. Um, and very soon, I promise, um, we'll also support the full DSL workflow. So when you, if you plan to use Perforce, uh, and if you plan to use Jenkins with the workflow plugin, then um, you will be able to very simply add this as part of your workflow definition. Um, I took half an hour. We've got a few minutes for, uh, left for, for Q&A. So if you want to see this live in action, um, then you can come over to Lightning Talk uh, or the pipeline, or if you have no questions, I'm happy to demonstrate it now as well. Um, and then I'll open it up for questioning. Yeah. Uh, you said you should limit the access to version control. Why is that? The, we should limit the access to version control. Um, limit the access in a way. So if, you, if you're a large company and you have um, 
uh, all your documents, every single document the company stored in one single version control, there are typically some sensitive data in there. Um, so I would, I would be careful to limit too much of that. Typically, the old source code, everything else is accessible, but there might be private documents or requirement documents or something like that that go in there as well, but probably you want to limit to a certain amount of people. The other thing is um, there's a difference in performance between read access and write access. So um, I certain, I'm certainly of opinion and uh, try, to, try to promote this idea um, as well that everyone should be able to read most documents, especially maybe sensitive ones, within the company. Um, but you don't want to allow everyone to write to a, a released version or something like this. There probably should be a limited access to this that goes through a rigorous reprocess. Re so um, in that respect, um, you don't ever open every single Git repository up to everyone submitting to the master code line. Uh, you have limit there as well. That's the kind of limit that I'm talking about. Any other questions? Um, to yeah. Uh, let me. Bring this website up if I can find my mouse. That is. This is the Jenkins pipeline I'm going to demonstrate later, by the way. Um, so code review and perforce looks like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a product, uh, a, a tool called Swarm um, that you, um, uh, it gives you a website that can then access and, and see the changes that are going in there. Uh, these changes can be either submitted changes. They just want to look through and, and say yes or no if you want to move them further down the line and have a branch. Or they can be, um, uh, shelf changes. So shelf changes are changes that are um, they're pending, they're stored on a server, but they're not submitted yet, and yet they can still be inspected by other people, including the, the reviewing system uh, as well. Um, you can create these reviews from, from our tools, PVV, or you can just write a, a tag into the, um, uh, into the description of uh, that pending change. In, in that, and that will trigger a review automatically. You can specify which pieces uh, you want to have that can look at that. And this change can then be inspected, um, and you can um, uh, also vote up or vote down this particular change in there. Now, with code review and Jenkinson pre built, let me have a look. Uh, not locked in anymore. I want to define the project. I can define for the project itself um, automated tests. And what happens when I enable this is I can specify a path to, um, to a Jenkins project um, that in here that will then picked up and automatically when you uh, submit the review goes off and builds the whole pipeline. It is, as I've learned today, uh, limited in that it builds everything and runs everything and says yes or no, uh, which is not specific enough for, uh, for every single test you want to run, but it certainly gives you an overview over a small change like this, uh, whether it passed test or not. And that is a useful hint to give to um, the reviewers. If it didn't even pass the compile stage or the, the test stage, there's no point for me reviewing that. I can just need to go um, uh, get it to work first and then come back to me, please. Um, that's the behind it. Um, so this is all possible, made possible through the Perforce plugin as well, which, which uh, publishes the right um, URLs for that. So you can then immediately go in there and say, uh, here's the change you want to um, uh, investigate. And it has then back pointers as well as back then, sends it back to Swarm and goes, uh, yes, it worked, or no, it didn't work. And publish that as OK. Any other questions? Okay, so let's have a look at the pipeline. Um, so the pipeline here consists of um, different uh, fixed stages 
uh, that each himself, uh, in this case, are freestyle, uh, a freestyle um, project. Let's open one of them up and go to the project itself. Okay. So this is a freestyle project. Um, it goes off, talks to my before server. This is the plugin, by the way. Um, uh, under these credentials, it uses streams. It could use all kinds of other ways of extracting the data uh, with some additional information. Um, it talks about the population of, of, of that that's been set up. Um, one of the very important things for us is those projects that tend to be in Perforce are large. You don't want to sink down hundreds of millions of files every single time you build something. You want to reuse the workspace and only update them as in have incremental builds, and this is all makes that possible. It even cleans the stuff up in case you have um, some files, artificial files flying around with that, and does it very quickly. But um, afterwards, I do some, I do some copying around of files, uh, maybe some other stages along the line, in this case, um, building my jar files, put them in the right place. For that, uh, label the files and um, uh, publish a credential as in submit the changes back uh, to the before server. But that's just one building block of that. That's not part of the pipeline. This either succeeds completely or it doesn't. I don't have to know if else or anything else in place. I just have the one single building block. The, next, the only thing I can do in here is trigger the next stage, which in this case is to uh, generate the, the Docker image that they want to use actually for, for this particular project. So that's a single bit that I can add to that. Uh, so if I go back to my build pipeline and look at the next stage, and configure. Um, I pass some parameters along, which you have to do through a temporary file or something like that. There's no real good mechanism for this. I know there's a plugin that can allow me to do this. So that's a pain in the to communicate between the different projects, uh, the different parameters. Um, again, talk to before server, pull the WAR file out, uh, put it in the right place to create my, um, my, uh, my Docker image, and then take that Docker image and uh, submit it back to Perforce uh, in here. Lots of different stages in there. But again, each block itself is monolithic. It's just one single thing in there, uh, backed up by an XML file behind it that just describes the whole thing. And the only thing I control for that is um, the parameters going in to each particular block. Now compare this to a, work, uh, to a, um, a workflow DSL. Um, let me see if you can get that up and running. Now that does probably doesn't work. It's on the wrong screen. Let's see if I can move this. Probably can show you this if I find the right uh, image here. Technical problem. Um, I tell you what, let me find the IP address of that. Here. So in the workflow itself, there's this now it's one single thing, which is a Groovy script. And in the Groovy script, I describe um, what's supposed to happen on one single node. On that note, I can then run commands, again, I'll plug in commands of that, including shell scripts and other bits and pieces. And that's what the DSL before will supply as well. So I've got a P4, in this case, it was called P4, but um, it's now called P4Sync. Uh, command, this part will sync the data down. It could be Git or SVN or whatever kind of tool you use for that kind of thing. Um, then put the, state, the, the building stages in there. 
I can run this now on several other nodes in parallel, build all these, uh, these things in pieces, and then in the end, uh, label it. This is, the, this is the old previous way of, of having to put step in there, which will be replaced by a proper DSL. Do you all know what DSL means? A question, yeah? DSL? Do you know what DSL means? Domain specific language. Um, so, what it basically is, is in a language like Groovy or Ruby or some other bits and pieces, you can leave the dot out for call a method, you can leave the brackets out, you can pass this parameter in there, so you can make up a English kind of language in that. So, uh, there are different ways to write this. You could write this with the step class and the brackets and other bits and pieces, pass the parameter and so on, or you can you can simply have a name for the function that that's then called, um, or the class that's called, um, and um, uh, pass parameters and that. This makes it a little bit easier to read uh, for us uh, silly humans. So this, this shell bit here, um, in reality, is a shell class that's the call with the parameters in of the command they want to put in there. Uh, it just makes it simpler to read in that screen interface. Um, and suddenly you have, and there, there were lots of examples of these, these workflow around uh, uh, here at the presentations uh, at the conference, um, you have the ability to write a, a reasonably complex program that describes all different stages in that. You don't have to pass parameters on through temporary files or something like that between the different stages of the pipeline. Um, and this is a text script that you can easily version as well. One of the things that we're going to add to our Perforce plugin is the ability to take this particular script and version as well and pull it out of the resource code control uh, at a later stage. So then another aspect, not just the, artifact, the, the source code and the requirement documents and the artifacts and the other bits and pieces and that, but also the pipeline itself will be versioned, which should be a natural thing, uh, but it's necessar not necessarily uh, so easy to do. But these pipelines will be more dynamic in the future, I would think, and not uh, fixed, rigorous, you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Because as you build more and more complex projects, uh, that's certainly be an important part of that. Does this answer your question? Are there some conditions so that you go from to the next uh, job? Yeah, this is Groovy, so it's, it's a language like, like Java, where, where the mixture of Java and Ruby. So you can put conditions in there. If this happens, then we do this, or we do that. I don't have a full example of this, but you find them on the, on the uh, um, workflow website of, uh, of Jenkins for the expression of the plugin, uh, what people have done with that uh, kind of thing. I'm not an expert myself, I have to admit. I've just started with that. So um, if, you, if you look at my um, GitHub or, or Perforce workshop, uh, you'll probably see new things popping up there in a few weeks' time in that respect. Any other question? Yes, we have two minutes left. Um, so I think we'll close it here. If you want to see this pipeline working in action and actually a project without that, please see me uh, quarter past one. Um, or come to our booth. Um, you know there's a, um, uh, a uh, sweepstake, no, a, a competition for a, uh, a Lego prize uh, in there. If you haven't participated yet, please come over and see us. There are also a few T-shirts left. Um, so if you want to learn more about Perforce or just want to grab some, grab some smack, then please come and see us uh, next time. So thank you very much for your attention.